it's an empowerment model. It's like you can train your nervous system and your brain and body to work together through any stressor. And no, we don't need to go back to whatever it is. Maybe there was an IED explosion, or maybe there was a, a tragic divorce and problems with your family when you got home. All of that is valid. But what I'm interested in is what are you going to do about it right now? There's a ton of agency right here in this moment when you strip away all that moral failing and judgment and analysis paralysis, trying to look at your life history for clues as to why you're broken. It's like, no, the right. system is working perfectly. You're having a response to chronic stress. Here's what you can do about it. Welcome to the Empowered Performance Podcast. I'm your host, Katie St. Clair, and I'm so grateful you are joining me. On each episode, I'll be chatting with movement-related experts and guests who have a passion for looking deeper into how we can enhance our human experience with movement, breath, and better understanding of the brain and body. Let's dive right in. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining. This is the Empowered Performance Podcast, and I'm here with Emily Hightower. Um, Emily is someone I greatly admire, has helped me a ton. She is my own personal coach now. She is an expert on neurophysiology, on working with trauma and veterans. You have also been a wilderness guide, a wilderness EMT, a river guide. You've taught yoga for 25 years. You just have like a huge broad perspective on movement and the breath. And I'm just super excited to have you here and kind of dive into some of the stuff that we're going to talk about today. So with that, Emily, can you give everybody a little background? And I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit because you're the first guest. And one of the things that I really want to do with this podcast is connect to the why and the people I plan on bringing on and why I wanted to bring you on are people who I can tell have like a really strong why and they have a passion mm. what they're doing and it's not just about a job for them it's mm. literally about changing lives and trying to make something more out of this world and so I was wondering before we start if you could tell us a little bit about yourself but also tell us a little bit about your why like how did you get to become a wilderness guide and dealing with veterans with trauma? Like, how does that even happen? Wow. Yes. Well, let's just get right to it, right? Let's get yeah. right get in. Well, um, first of all, I'm really honored to be here. Uh, your work is so important and impactful. And the conversations that we have in our coaching sessions ignite the leading edge of my work, like your understanding of what my approach is about and, and kind of where it can help in your own work have just been profoundly rewarding. So, you know, um, I hesitate to like go on and on about my own story. I'd rather talk about you and, and all these other things, but <laughs> I put you on the spot that, here. Um, you know, the, the kind of Disney origin story of my work is so rooted in trauma and, from the time I was nine until 17 in those really formative teenage years, I went through a lot of trauma. I you know, witnessed my mom's traumatic brain injury on um, a road bike up here in Aspen coming down Independence Pass. I got to ride with her in the ambulance, be there for the fight, the flight for life. Um, so that left an indelible mark when I was nine um, around injury, trauma, how life can just suddenly get scooped out from under you and you can just have that falling sensation. Um, so that happened. Um, my dad was in and out of addiction treatment. When I was 15, he lost the battle and took his life. So I went into my first years of high school, um, having witnessed traumatic injury addiction, um, this traumatic loss of my dad, who was, you know, it's been a long time now, but as <laughs> this kind of trauma for me is a, is a real um, lifelong process of understanding mortality, um, his path, you know, he was a loving, avid outdoorsman. Um, when he was drinking, it wasn't a violent kind of drunk. It was this just 
obvious coping tool um, that was misleading him. So when you ask about my why, I can't help but reflect on that like Disney origin story of like how yeah. all the kids in Disney movies until recently are orphaned and they're figuring their own lives out. Well, that experience, by the time I was in high school, I realized I've got to figure out a way to create some stability for myself that no one can take from me. And it left this curiosity, like what is it inside of a human being that can make or break them? Why did somebody like my dad who had quote it all, friends, a great career, um, physical health, uh, what was it about his own biology, uh, his physiology, what was going on in his body, his mind, where he couldn't quite break through. And so a couple mantras kind of got planted in me. One was don't miss it. I didn't want to miss a thing. And the other was like this courageous exploration. I just could feel this turning point. Like I'm either going to face life and figure out how to live it fully and not miss it, or I'm going to get swallowed up by grief and pain and uncertainty. Um, and so luckily I had a few really important teachers. One is Paige Robinson, six years older than me. We grew up like sisters together and she was a black sheep in our kind of family groups that all hung out and raised kids together. She followed the yoga path early. She was an Iyengar yoga teacher. So she grabbed me when I was 15, 16, 17, and was like, um, um, you, you come with me to my class. And I remember being in her Iyengar class and being self-conscious. I was incredibly self-conscious at that time. And she would guide me into these places in my body that now I understand I had dissociated from. Mm -hmm. And her cueing of little subtle things in the body, like pull the floating ribs in, draw the tailbone south, breathe. <laughs> it was like, I had this incredible transformation in that moment of like, oh, I do have a place inside of me where there is stability that I can create through the structure of my body by turning the light of awareness into the present time in my own body. And I don't need to fix all the problems of trauma and injury outside of me. Those things are still going to happen. That was clear to me. But there's a place that I can create internally where I can find that stability and not miss it. So wow. that's really what started me. So now my why is I've had this kind of other mantra of like, just put me to work. You know, how can I ease suffering in other people who are potentially missing it and feeling stuck in the way that I felt during those years and the way that my dad felt and the way that my mom felt in her healing journey, like just put me to work. Wow. That's incredible. I mean, it's crazy to me that I've worked with you for this long and I had no idea um, but of course I know with the relationship, it's more like I'm coming to you for help and <laughs> that is part of a, you know, being a coach, I'm sure. But that's, I find it like really remarkable, like thinking about my own childhood and like how I was at 15, I don't think I could have processed those things in that way. Do you feel like you've always had like a gift to be able to, to, I guess, understand what was going on in your head like I just feel as at 15 years old it's like we're just all over the place oh yeah I mean I didn't, this was a long journey that had a lot of diagonals it was not a straight line it was squiggly and there were whirlpools along the way where I was lost and um so I've shared some of the seeds of insight that I think gave me some um something to grab onto and grow that gave me some stability that's still unfolding, right? It's, there's no guru method, no guru thing about my work. It's like, I'm in it with everybody. I've, I've always been drawn to that. Um, that's why I love the wilderness is like, it's nature. It doesn't care about us in that way. You, you've got to care. You've got to show up when you're in on a wild river up in the mountains, you have to pay attention. Um, so long way of saying I did not have it all figured out at 15. Knowing you, Katie, you would have totally figured it out. <laughs> you have through your own 
trauma. Me a long time, but yeah. You know, but I, I know I was given, I was reflecting on this recently. I was given a real gift by my parents, especially my mom, because she is all about freedom. So as a child, she gave my brother and myself tons of time to be as we were without a lot of pressure. I mean, we spent our childhood in the mountains and it was all about, you know, rivers and water and bugs and play and um, just happiness. It wasn't this pressure cooker of like, you've got to prove yourself to fit into this family. It She's a, she's a wonderful, free, creative spirit. So That's I think, she, yeah, I think all kids that get time to be themselves in nature without the pressure of performing um, have a, have a better shot. And if you haven't gotten that as a child, well, it's not too late because nature's part of us. We are nature. So you can go find that connection now and free up some of the constraints that I, again, noticed in my dad's life were part of the pressure cooker that pulled him away from center and that trust in his innate worth. Yeah, that's so interesting to have like that dichotomy between your mom and your dad. And, you know, I think about like an 80s child, it was like, you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer or a banker, right? And like, we grew up with those expectations where you don't really talk about your feelings and you sort of just plug through. And mm -hmm. so it's actually, to me, it seems very unusual that you had a mother in that generation that was like that. Nowadays, I feel like people are starting to come mm -hmm. around to this awareness that we have a lot of problems with, you know, all the technology and everything. And like, we're having to try to create these spaces, but um, that's just fascinating to me. So, mm -hmm. so when did you actually start like working and what was your first job in this kind of world? Was it in the wilderness first or like, how did that yeah, happen? I, you know, when I was in college, I was, I became a river guide in the summers Okay, and look, that was just about escape and pleasure and fun and challenge and community. Like I found my people in this subculture of whitewater kayakers and river guides that were living in trucks. And I was at home. It was like, as long as a guy is wearing like the same Patagonia shorts for over a week <laughs> without showering, like he has my attention. It was, it was like, I Your was standards were really high there. there. <laughs> <laughs> and my standards were like, if a guy can cook in the wilderness, you know, then yeah, he has my attention. So I found some powerful women friends. I found that sense of um, adventure and self-confidence through, again, that uh, incredible power outside of me that was the river, um, that was nature. Um, but I went into uh, a wilderness EMT program when I was, gosh, probably 20. And my first career was getting on the mountain ambulance service here in Aspen. So I lived a seasonal life for five years where I would river guide all over the place in the summer, living out of my truck at, in a teepee, like full adventure. Then I'd come back during the winter season in Aspen and live in these tiny little dorms with like a hot plate. Um, I'd walk from there to the hospital, meet my team. We'd team up into different ambulance groups and um, work this mountain ambulance service. Um, after five years of that, I felt like, okay, I'm either going to need to pursue higher learning as a paramedic, as a physician assistant, even, or a nurse, like go deeper into emergency medicine or something else. And it was clear to me that that something else was around preventative healing and the healing arts. I'd had that yoga seed planted when I was 15. I had continued to study and practice up until that point. And my yoga studies were starting to get to become really important as a counterbalance to the physical nature of my work. And I followed that. I found my next teacher, Deborah Cohen, um, who was a is a phenomenal outdoors woman, deeply connected to nature. Uh, and so she started handing me the torch of pranayama breathing. I had noticed on the ambulance and on the river that breath was obviously central to managing fear and pain. So intuitively, that instrument was coming through me, uh, whether I was teaching 
teenagers how to navigate class three, four whitewater, where they're rolling upside down, stuck in a kayak. Like if they're afraid, they can't hold their breath as long. There was that dynamic. Then there was the acute um, pain of trauma, injury, illness on the ambulance, dealing directly with people, mm -hmm. taking people on a raft trip, a group of people that if they're afraid, they're not going to paddle for me. I want to, I, I want to get through these rapids too. So those experiences taught me a lot. So by the time I studied pranayama breath and movement as a preventative healing art for self-healing, I knew I had found the doorway into finally processing a lot of my own stuff that was still buried from my own experiences of not being fully resolved, as well as a new profound tool uh, to help other people not miss it. Like, get out of your own way and, and start to explore these self-healing tools. Yeah. I find it. I still think it's fascinating that you were experiencing all that so young, because some of the things that I've learned from you are just the ability. I'd say the main thing that helps me the most is the ability to just actually know that I have a feeling and then process. Okay. I'm having that stop for a minute. What is my body trying to tell me? Mm -hmm. And not even going beyond that. Like sometimes I don't, I maybe, I don't know why, but I don't do the breathing drill or I don't, you know, take the time to do the neuro nidra or the meditation or whatever I'm rushing through life. But just the acknowledgement has been life changing. And I feel like you sort of grew up recognizing that you had to acknowledge it or the boat was going to flip and everybody was going to be losing their mind <laughs> along with you. And so it's like, it, you, it was like almost you were learning by doing this thing, what you would eventually teach to people. Mm, Do you feel exactly. like that? Like, it's just kind of a weird, I would, I was never exposed to anything like that at a younger age, like having to, you know, maybe if you are in you know, emergency medicine of some sort, that's just part of it. You kind of mm. naturally learn those things, you know? Well, yes, it's, well, it ties together around stress versus chronic stress exposure. So I was fascinated by the chronic stress again with my dad, something going on there, being in these Alcoholic Anonymous meetings as a family, going myself to Al-Anon for kids of alcoholic parents. I observed in those young years, uh, formative years, that in those groups, there were people of all backgrounds, all ages, that this addiction thing that was pulling people out of themselves, out of their bodies, was indiscriminate, just like the river. It's indiscriminate. It's right. So I I think that's a big piece of how I started learning my current approach and what I continue to learn now is that each one of us, by being human beings, we're innately worthy. We won, we won already, we got the gold star, we're here, we're born in a physical experience. So you don't need to prove yourself to be worthy of being here. And we are all facing acute and chronic stress patterns that if we are not aware of how to engage in real time with awareness, with the body and our feelings, and we are only living from the neck up trying to process all of this stuff, then uh, we're doomed to end up in these um, dysregulated cycles and, and patterns. And those patterns can collate to a place where, you know, you can't point to the stress anymore. And that's always been really interesting to me with trauma. It's like, and you and I worked through some, some of this material of like the, the world is contracting things you used to be able to enjoy, uh, are now you're highly sensitized to. And so if you're dealing with that from the neck up, you're going to analyze the world around you. Yeah. If you learn how to be aware and present with what your body's telling you, now you can show up in real time. And just by being aware of that, you've already started to self-regulate. Do you find that to be true? Oh yeah. I mean, in a way it's hard for me to express because I know, obviously we've talked a lot about this and I'm, I really, I want to come back to this question because it's in my head right now, but like how, what is the difference between what's happening in your brain and in your body from acute stress and chronic stress? And then also how they overlap and can, 
I, I guess, at least in my mind, I think of this chronic stress that I had for most of my life that I wasn't really dealing with in the best way possible. Not that I wasn't trying. I just didn't get, have the resources. I think that were, that worked for me. I tried a lot of things, but then when an acute stress happened, the massive response that I had, I think because of all the chronic stress was just something I can never, I really can't ever explain it to anybody. Mm -hmm. And so and in some ways, like it almost sounds like what you were saying with your parents, it's like you had this chronic stress because of your mom's accident. And then you had this massive acute stress with your dad. Mm -hmm. And then it's just, I'm very curious. So can you like walk us through what is literally happening in the brain when we're chronically stressed versus acute stress? And is there like a significant difference or is it just kind of more pronounced? Well, it's, that is the work right there, right? So we are all designed to be able to respond to stress. Stress as it, as, as it can be defined is just something that challenges your systems to respond. And what makes a stress healthy or not isn't the stressor, it's how you respond to it. It's the dosage, it's the timing, it's the content of it and how it meets your body. So, um, you know, something like traveling to a third world country and being immersed in a totally new environment where you're stripped of comforts and things that you're used to that make you feel safe. That's for, for me, when I got to travel to India uh, with a, a friend of mine who was getting stem cell therapy there, we were dropped in the heart of New Delhi. And, and for me, that was an incredible um, stressor that, you know, challenged my systems, challenged me to show up and understand myself in the context of, of a place that I'd never been. So um, that's important to, to kind of get a grip on before you look at acute or chronic stress. What is stress? Healthy stress means that you can respond to it well. What does that mean? It means that you can activate a sympathetic fight, flight, or high freeze response to turn on your arousal systems, to react uh, and go through the experience of the stressor and then learn from it. That can be resistance training. That can be metabolic work. That can be hiking up a mountain. That could be going down a rapid in a river. It could be being in a new environment that feels risky, challenging, unsafe, uncertain, right? So if a stressor like that, that comes your way is too much for your system to respond to, you know, let me back up. You have this response of sympathetic activity and arousal in a healthy system. After that, you recover and you regain parasympathetic. There's a rebound in the parasympathetic system that comes in to repair tissue, to learn. So in the brain, when you respond in a healthy way to stress, you learn from the experience so that the next time you're exposed to it, you remember what you did successfully, what you may have done that wasn't successful. And hopefully if it's a stressor you're gonna have repeatedly, that exposure works out in your favor. The way you respond continues to improve and you there you're gaining skill, you're gaining agency, you're gaining a sense of, of um, yeah, competency in life, right? So that's the human being right there is just responding to stress is a good thing. That's how we evolve. So. And a chronic stressor is something that uh, your system is getting hammered by repeatedly without recovering from. And they can be really, really subtle. Right now, the big one that we're seeing at shift is in the modern attention economy. We are incredibly mentally overstimulated while being physically disconnected. This means the physical system isn't getting a chance to process the stress in a healthy way. We're designed to meet stress in the body, not just the mind. So if you have any stressor that you are not processing completely and recovering from, um, and you get dosed with it repeatedly, you're going to start to have chronic stress, which means your stress response system starts to get depleted. You're not rebounding in the parasympathetic anymore. You're starting to get into dysregulation which is going to narrow your overall tolerance to all stressors. And this is why people, that's the def definition of trauma is a stressor that you is too much for your system to recover from. And so you, you collate patterns of 
bracing dissociation, um, this narrower window of tolerance is one model that we use. Um, you will start to show up in, in the way we've talked about where things you used to enjoy or feel fine doing, now you're overly sensitive to them because your parasympathetic healing wing is not rebounding. It's not coming in to create tissue repair. The brain is not learning from the experience. It's now starting to shut down. Um, there's a great talk that Brian McKenzie and Martin McPhillamy are doing right now called uh, Decoding the Breath Print of Disease and Mind. And um, it's evergreen. Like they're doing the talks now, but people can go anytime and buy them. They're doing a phenomenal job of explaining the science behind what happens in the pH system and carbon dioxide and in the brain tissue around uh, chronic stress and trauma. So anyone that's interested in diving into the science should listen to that talk. It supports the Health and Human Performance Foundation. and uh, But hopefully that can give people a sense. Um, yeah, I actually saw that and I'm going to sign up for it because I know for me personally, actually understanding what is happening is really helpful versus just do this thing because it'll feel good or it'll calm you down. But I don't, I still don't feel like, I feel like in our work so far, I haven't really spent the time to learn as much as I'd like, mainly because I'm just trying to figure my own stuff out. But I think it would help me to actually hear that talk and like really understand the neurophysiology behind it and what is happening in the brain. Um, because you see all these, like for me, it ended up in a thyroid disorder that they still can't figure out that they think is from my pituitary gland. Well, all of that is probably connected and it probably happened due to this chronic stress. Um, is there anything you can tell us, like for people who are listening to this, that is a pathway to understanding if you're in that zone of living up in your head and not mm -hmm. recognizing what's happening in your body. Because for me, like, I think I knew it, but I didn't know it. I was so unaware of my body that I, I was, I didn't, how, how do you even get someone to recognize that in the first place? That's a great question. I mean, that is, that is the power of the approach around the skill of stress work that I do and what I've uncovered with working 20 plus years now with uh, lots and lots and lots of different trauma populations from addiction to combat veterans, et cetera, neurology patients, the pattern in all of us, all these different populations I've worked with myself included is that, you know, when you are, wait, can you repeat the exact question one more time? <laughs> well, if you're someone who's been living up in your head for so long yeah, and has this uh, stress, like, how do you even know that you're there? How do you, the, um, the similarity with all those populations is that, you know, when you are uh, dysregulated, culturally, the message is that something's wrong with you. And you're also learning how to cope and behave and get by and often are rewarded for external gains while being dysregulated. This, we see this a lot in athlete populations. As long as you're making the workouts, making the time, those gains can give you reinforcement that you're okay. You're getting the endorphins from exercise. You're accomplishing the peak that you bagged, whatever it is. But if you're disconnected to the larger stress systems in the body, you might be pushing yourself into long-term depletion. Um, we use a, a blend that I've created, a blend of Daniel Siegel's window of, window of tolerance model and um, Stephen Porges' polyvagal theory uh, called the zones of connection and dysregulation. And it's more of a circular model. And the idea is that when you are connected, start with that. What does that look like in your body? What does it feel like to be connected? Well, it means that you have emotional regulation. We can look at data points to, to test um, baseline levels of heart rate variability, CO2 tolerance, muscle tone, um, there are ways, you know, for you to get baseline information from your body around when it's connected. Uh, and then what, what happens when you're disconnected or dysregulated in the margins up high, that means hyper arousal, you're overly aroused. So you're going to, um, breath rate's going to change and be higher. You're going to have more CO2 sensitivity Your CO2 tolerance test will be lower. 
than it is at baseline um, when you're super hyper aroused and hypersensitive. Um, reading your body, what that feels like, it's important to feel it. So this is why cold exposure can be one helpful stressor that I give with a disclaimer. You know, it's, it's not helpful to practice that if you're um, having a lot of anxiety and all, you know, that's, that's something I do in my private coaching is like assess where you are, what stressors can you take on? And what you and I were able to do together really quickly was shift from when you're dysregulated, thinking about those external causes that yeah. spinning mind is one of the quickest ways for people to read what's going on in the body. Oh, just notice if your mind is spinning on the future or stuck in the past with regrets, that's all you need to know. You're not present. You're not in a zone of connection. You're starting to flip into the margins of either hyper arousal up high or hype O arousal, the deep freeze response where we just shut down. And then in this model, there's the wired and tired on the side where you're spinning into biphasic, high, low, high, low exhaustion. Um, so in all of these groups of people that I've gotten exposure to, what's worked the, the, what's been the most helpful as you've found and what we've been talking about is suspending the story long enough to participate in real time with your physiology. Because usually those dysregulated stress reactions will exacerbate the spinning out, looking for the solution outside of yourself. Because it doesn't feel good to be depressed and stuck and unmotivated. There is a moral failure associated with that state that can start to take over the whole system. Mm -hmm. But if you learn that like, oh no, your body's trying to tell you something, you can intercept that in real time and upregulate, bring your body back into connection, bring your brain back into connection. And then you can, from a connected place, work on material. If you try to work on that material when you're dysregulated, you're spinning in circles. I think that's why for me personally, talk therapy was always such a hard thing because it, I left feeling more up in my head and more dysregulated because I never was like dealing with the, the physiology of what was happening in my body. So I could actually process these things, which that's just so mind blowing to me because mm -hmm. if you think about it in like your allopathic or traditional medical care, and even I've had some really great therapists, but none of them ever, I mean, I've probably seen five or six different therapists. None of them ever worked on the, that portion of the regulating so that you can actually talk about things that may be on your mind that you want to process through. Mm -hmm. You find that that is becoming, I mean, I know the work that you're doing is trying to get this message out there to people, but do you think that's ever going to be integrated in, in like the traditional medical setting? So, cause most people are living in that in the United States, at least are living in this traditional medical setting. So when they go mm -hmm. and get a referral to see, you know, a therapist or a psychiatrist, a lot of times they're not even considering some of these things. Well, there is a tipping point coming and the New York times recently published an article on somatic healing and how, uh, learning about the somatic nervous system, which is where we sense and direct behavior from the physical tissues of the body, from the fascia, the nerves, like the, that the somatic system is being recognized now as needing to be integral in counseling. Uh, so I'm developing some teacher training for psychotherapists, um, counselors, because their work is so valuable. It has such an important place. And I can't diagnose personality disorders or PTSD, but my work is about this um, integration of these skills. So when might a counselor invite someone to actually stop verbal processing? and actually connect to what's going on inside the body in that vital moment where they've tapped into some material that is starting to create a current of reactivity in the nervous system. To me, that's the whole point of talking. Let's, let's talk just enough to find the interesting material that you react to, because 
A physiological reaction is there to show you two things. What you're afraid of, meaning why do you have an avoidance protection freeze fight flight response? So what are you afraid of? And number two, what do you really care about? So I'm interested in everyone's stories, but I don't need to know them completely in, in a historical way in order to help someone. That was an invaluable thing, especially working with combat veterans. Our stories are sacred. They are personal. They are the material, the, the trauma stories that we have are the material that's living in these chronic stress patterns. So asking someone to tell me what happened, I always wait until they're asking for help. If there's an ask and they want help, then um, it's up to them what part of their stories they, they want to share. But I'm more interested in what's what's the material you get to choose how to look at this. What's the material that comes up for you when you're having these reactions in your body? First, can you read them? Second, can you connect with awareness to your breath? Get your lid of your higher mind back online. Get more connected so you can see what's important from that. So um, I do want to be a part of this movement, helping these incredible professionals that have this advanced training in um, psychiatry, counseling, therapy, to start integrating uh, skills around the somatic system so people can leave those counseling sessions feeling connected to their bodies and some agency around their own response. Um, I've partnered with some incredible um, counselors and psychiatrists. Um, so I love integrating care with those who are understanding the importance of this. Yeah, that's amazing. I didn't realize you were working on that. I feel like that's going to be a really big game changer to have a resource like that for actually professionals that want to learn this information. Because part of it too, I feel like it's not, it's definitely not the provider's fault. It's, it's just the system as a whole. And then like, it's, it's always been done this way. So we'll just keep doing it this way. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it takes some like change makers to like, to come in and say, wait a second, even though there's no evidence-based research at the moment, there is enough that we can look at to find some things that might work a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, so I applaud you for actually doing that because I know that um, you probably live on this border and we've talked about this, even myself, like I'm kind of not a physical therapist at all. I'm not really a trainer. I'm sort of in this weird world where I do have to help people that are in pain, even though I'm not trying to treat their pain. And mm -hmm. so it creates like a line of gray. And I think you're kind of existing in that gray zone too. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that that's a really hard place to be sometimes. Uh, I think it's absolutely comparable where you and I live in our work. And it's exciting because there is a body of research out there now to support somatic movement, somatic healing, breath-based healing, interventions around postural alignment and movement. Um, the research has has is starting to be done. There's some that already exist. And um, for me, it's the empirical evidence. When, you know, let's look at the conventional system right now. Before COVID, I worked year round with combat veterans. Since COVID and joining SHIFT full-time, I see uh, my groups maybe three or four times a year. Before COVID, it was 25 retreats a year. So I got exposure since 2006 to these amazing groups of veterans. And um, the, the incredible opportunity that they gave me to understand this body of work comes in part from their ability to share with me the current conventional system. Firefighters too, that I've worked with. When they identify dysregulation or dysfunction, they meaning leadership, bureaucracy, these are government institutions, right? Your battalion chief in fire or your um, superior in any branch in the military, they will send you to, um, in the military's case, the VA for an assessment. And if you show symptoms of anxiety and depression, insomnia, those symptoms aren't the root cause. The trauma isn't even necessarily the root cause. 
it's chronic stress. It's chronic deployment, uh, malnourishment, um, the collective load on the system around sleep. And there's lots of stuff to talk about there. But the solution in the conventional model is talk therapy and medication. So the people that I've worked with in those communities, by the time I'm meeting them, some of them have been deployed seven plus times. And they are so tired of the talk therapy model because it hasn't gotten them, most of them, anywhere. They're tired of sharing their story as if that's the main problem. A lot of them are like, I loved my job. I actually felt great out there. It's coming home. That's really hard for me. So that's what got me paying attention to, you know, it's, it's not, it's so easy to look at a combat veteran and say, oh, you've seen trauma. Mm -hmm. I've never served in the military. I don't know what it's like to have a gun pointed at me or to be in co live combat. I, to suppose anything about that is audacious and it's too easy for us in the civilian world to assume like, oh, you've seen trauma, you're messed up. That's what's causing your problems. Let's talk about it. And then here's some medication to help you. Well, that doesn't work. Why doesn't that work for most people? And that's what started me really observing this connection between people I was meeting and working with, breathing, which requires presence in the body here and now, and this ultimate deeper why of self-healing, inner stability, and that reconnection that I wanted for my dad, that I've pursued for myself. Um, so what quote works are things like archery, things like having a challenge in nature that is at a stress load you can handle. So we do adaptive sports camps where there's climbing walls and there's rivers and there's mountains and there's skiing. It's not about like skiing fast. It's can you notice when you're in the crowds at the base of the ski lift that your breathing is changing. Someone touched your shoulder that caused your reaction. That's not because you're broken. That's because your brain is working. It's learned to be hypersensitive to certain conditions. You've been operating with chronic stress loads outside of your zone of connection, maybe for de a decade. So rather than beat yourself up for, oh, I can't even stand in a ski line or go to a restaurant. Okay, well, let me teach you what's going on in your brain and body and how to breathe into this moment to reconnect, not to fix. And let's carve some agency in perspective in that moment so that you can get back to the business of relearning and retraining. It's a it's an empowerment model. It's like you can train your nervous system and your brain and body to work together through any stressor. And no, we don't need to go back to whatever it is. Maybe there was an IED explosion or maybe there was a, a tragic divorce and problems with your family when you got home. All of that is valid. But what I'm interested in is what are you going to do about it right now? There's a ton of agency right here in this moment when you strip away all that moral failing and judgment and analysis paralysis, trying to look at your life history for clues as to why you're broken. It's like, no, the right. system is working perfectly. You're having a response to chronic stress. Here's what you can do about it. Even just hearing you explain this now on the podcast, I feel like so many people that have never heard this are going to feel relief just hearing that that's a possibility. Because I think personally, I can literally picture myself at the bottom of that ski lift and understand what you're talking about. And then you're going in your head, but why do I feel like this? What's wrong with me? Why do, why am I like this? You know, what made me like this? I have a chemical imbalance. Like, you know, you start going to all these crazy places. Is there... Can you kind of give, this is really random and you might not be able to do this, but like a mock scenario, like there's the combat veteran with the chronic stress at the bottom of the hill and there's all these people around and how they get from the monkey brain that you call it and like overanalyzing everything to I'm, I'm coming back to myself. Mm -hmm. You mentioned with, before we got on the awareness piece and like how important that is. And it almost like it doesn't even really matter what, mm -hmm. what strategy you're using is just having a strategy of, of yeah. any kind. Yeah. A little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Well, the first piece is reading what's going on inside of your body instead of hyper-focusing on judging yourself and trying to fix the conditions around you. So in that case example, um, 
you know, you're, you're surrounded by people and you're having some claustrophobia and you're having a fear response. And if you can read agitation, spinning mind, um, high stress, breath pattern, high in the chest, vertical breathing, sweaty palms, racing thoughts, um, protective avoidant behavior. Okay, great. So what you don't want to do is then go, why can't I control myself? I'm broken. Oh my God, the, the so-and-so was right. Like I have this condition and I can't even do this anymore. It's like, now you're starting to spin in the mind. So there are several doorways in through the somatic system where you can sense and direct yourself to the autonomic, right? So the autonomic nervous system is automated. It's having subconscious reactions, creating those pupil dilation changes and sweat and heart rate and breath rate changes. But through things like voluntary breathing, you know, this whole time we've both been breathing, but if you take a moment and empty your lungs and then intentionally inhale for four, pause for two and exhale for six, you have just yoked structures in the cortex system of your brain, the motor cortex, the prefrontal cortex in order to breathe voluntarily. So by design, voluntary breathing has this beautiful byproduct of reconnecting, if you will, rewiring uh, the structures of the higher logical, rational brain with the structures around survival, like your limbic system. And uh, so you're already starting to become present. You read the situation without judging yourself. You took a few voluntary breaths right there is a lifetime of training, but it's very simple, right? That you can take that very deep. But if people can just know that it's not just a saying like, take a deep breath. Um, if you start to change the um, rate and mechanics of your breathing to get low, slow, radial, extend your exhales, learn about the nose, when to use it, why. Now you've got a tool that's with you all the time. It's free. It's portable. It's customizable. It gets better with use. It gets more automated with use. Um, so from there, once they've breathed the higher mind back online, they're starting to get more connected. There are somatic tools around touching the responses in the nervous system. So if there's a lot of high anxiety, you and I've done the, a little bit of this work where you can touch the go reflex of like what happens when you are autonomically wired to fight or flight, the back body fires, the will center, the heart stick out, the palms might clench or the thumbs roll out, the quads tighten up, the large muscle groups of the body are preparing to fight or flight touch that reflex. It's not all about calming down, touch it for a moment and then use exhales to release it. Right. So there's lots of somatic tools to help people get present. Okay. I'm here now. And then there are mantras, self-speak neuro-linguistic programming that I teach to help people carve new associations of presence and capacity with the current environmental exposure, whatever it is. So I've, I've helped people that have fear of flying that weren't able to go out to restaurants anymore, couldn't ride a bike, whatever the, so again, I'm looking for those specific stressors not to analyze them and what happened in their lives was to say, oh, would you like to ride a bike again? That'd be a great indication of capacity. Great, here are the tools. Here's how to carve new associations with your in, inner capacity to do that. Yeah, that's amazing. I. I know it so well. I mean, I've been living it. I remember vividly the first time I got on a bike ride with my son and it was beyond scary, like in a way that is not normal. And now I don't really even think about it much. And it's only been, you know, maybe um, a year, but in that time, there's been so much uh, change in my ability to be normal. If uh, it's probably the wrong word to use, but in that situation, not feel like I'm so amped up. I, I'm curious about this from your lens because I have been kind of teaching this. We talked about before I got on with my course in this last um, lecture that I gave and 
you know, I've added to, to that lecture, some of the things that you teach about, because what I find, I have a big audience that follows me for the positional breathing drills that, you know, I talk a lot about a lot of the postural restoration institutes information that I've kind of brought into my model of training. And what I think there's a, dis there's a big disconnect there. Um, everything they're giving is amazing, but there's a lack of understanding of the way that the autonomic nervous system is being impacted and how important it is to, to get to this place that you're talking about for some people before you even implement those strategies. Mm, exactly. So sometimes those strategies can get that person to that calm place, but sometimes it, they don't work and you don't see the movement changes that you hope for. Mm -hmm. And in most of those cases, I'm finding it is people who have been living under this chronic stress, haven't learned the tools to manage their autonomic nervous system, calm their you know, physiology down, so that when they do the drills themselves, they actually have more benefit. I think they can go both ways, just depending on who you're working with. 100%. And so I've been teaching that, like, if you're, don't put people through the, the frustration of trying to get an outcome out of a drill. Mm -hmm. 100%. Up here. And if it's not working, bag it. Tell yeah. them to go yeah. home for five minutes, you yeah. know, and then try it after a couple weeks of giving them some of these tools. And I think as movement professionals, which is a lot of people who are going to listen to this, starting to learn these tools is incredibly important in the 21st century and passing those on to our clients, mm -hmm. because I think we're going to see more of this dysregulation and getting less success with our training outcomes because of it. Do you have any thoughts on that? More. Well, I just love your insight. I love your work and your insight and your approach. And it's so very important because our entire uh, Western modern life model is about outcomes instead of process. If you're a movement professional and you're starting to tinker with a client's breath and trying to bring them into areas of their body that may be associated with uh, chronic conditions of protection, avoidance, traumatic memory, these things are buried in our tissues. It's not an intellectual thing. You know, just as we were talking about how when you are experiencing a stressor, your body learns. And if you go through it well and you recover well, you learn strategies to face that exact same stressor again with skill and you gain more capacity when encountering that specific stressor. So that's weightlifting in a nutshell, right? Yeah. Anything, um, public speaking, flying, whatever, riding a bike. But if you um, have chronic stress conditions, which we all have buried in certain locations of the body that have not had the chance to learn and recover well, what the body learned was protection, avoidance, and dissociation. So. Um, if, for example, someone has tragically dealt with sexual abuse, which is rampant in our culture, a lot of, and it's not something people are going to readily share and you're a movement professional wanting to help that person and you're outcome focused, like I've got this breath drill for you to do, just asking someone to breathe with awareness into that body can reignite that tissue into dysregulation. It did not have the chance to learn and recover fully and create capacity and agency, which is possible in my belief with any stressor. But if the stressor was too much and the person wasn't given the chance to recover fully and create that connection and agency back into that area of the body, then um, the, the drill, if you will, if the measurement is some kind of external outcome, then we're missing the opportunity to just gently create more awareness of being able to inhabit these parts of the body safely without being connected to some kind of external metric, especially with a coach. You know, that's intimidating to enter areas of the body that have dissociation, pain, trauma, chronic protection, avoidance, and then you're being observed with your breath and you're supposed to do it right. So breath's popularity comes with a cost right now. Mm -hmm. 
And it's that this, it, if there's any outcome, it should, it, in my opinion right now, it should just be um, loving awareness and uh, an approach that allows people to start inhabiting present time in their tissues. That's it. So uh, I, I love that your insight around like, if it's not quote working, let it go. Yes, because in all of this, we're talking about titrating, dose and exposure, just do the minimum to get a response that the person can grow and learn from. And then you're quote successful. Okay, so we're gonna revisit this again when we create the right conditions. And that requires a lot of trust with working with somebody. Yeah, it really does. And I, I feel like even just having this conversation with you and people hearing this, just recognizing and putting it out there, because I'm guilty of this, exactly what you just kind of expressed, you know, and not being aware of how sensitive somebody, somebody's nervous system was. And I just want to get the message out. Like I want more people to hear it because the other, the other side of the coin is the coach that's going, what I'm doing isn't working. I'm not a good enough coach, mm. but it's, it's the same thing. Like you kind of teaching the professionals, this other resource, they may blame themselves and say, why isn't this person getting better? And I've been seeing them for years and it's still the same thing. Yeah. And what am I doing wrong too? So it, it creates like a big disconnect from the coach's side of things and their own judgment of themselves. And then also from the person who's in the performance of the mm -hmm. real or whatever. And anytime there's like a loss of communication and we're not feeling each other in that moment and we're not able to sense, it's like thinking of it now from the big picture and coming back to your example in the beginning of this relationship to the earth as being this powerful thing that sort of got you out of your head it's the same thing when when i think about nature and the earth it's it's a reminder that there's this large huge communication network that's happening there's trees everywhere and animals and plants and it's all connected and when we are able to connect like that with each other we're part of that whole system and when we're not we're not part of the system anymore we just tapped out again yeah. So it's, um, the whole thing is like really fascinating to me. I probably spend, spend way too much time thinking about this stuff, <laughs> but I, I, I but it, putting it out there, I think we'll make some big changes in the industry because the fitness industry is really kind of a mess. If you look at the big picture, you know, well, we're all attached to our own performance and outcomes of clients. If we're coming from that model. So I just love Eastern philosophy and the only exposure I've had to it is through advanced yoga training, uh, which has its own historical embedded kind of imprints that aren't necessarily aligned or healthy. Um, but what I love about Eastern philosophy is like when the student is ready, the teacher appears, like there has to be an ask before learning something. And in our model, it's like the coaches are saying, I have something to give you. You need this. I'm going to sell this to you. I'm going to fix you. I'm going to get you these outcomes. That's broken right there. You're already starting on a flawed premise because the person that you're working with doesn't need you, to be clear. Like, I'm not helping people, which sounds so weird. I'm in it, living and exploring like you said, the ecosystem of the forest, I'm a part of that forest of humanity. And if there's alignment and there's a, an ask for something I'm experiencing that's making sense to me, then I can branch out and share that. But I'm not attached to or in charge of what that other uh, being does with these tools and information. They're not even mine. They're theirs to work with. So their outcome isn't mine. I, if I were audacious enough to, to tell them where they're going, well, now the relationship's already flawed because there's something so much bigger out there for each of us when we're invited to tap into the currency of our own physiology, our own desires, our own connections that I think a teacher or a coach's role is to step way back and respect what can't ever be known about the people you're working with. 
not just their histories, but where they're going, where they're going to take what they choose to learn from you, because all of what we're offering isn't resonant. So I'm a big fan in my own work of continually stripping away the audacity to think that I can help someone or get them someplace. It's I'm more curious about here with you right now. I get to be with Katie right now. And I see you as, as infinitely brilliant. I experience you as this mother tree that I'm always learning from. So I never feel like in our sessions, like I'm, I'm here to fix you. I feel like we get to share in this empowered process together of shared growth and learning. Um, and your authenticity as a teacher is why I'm so drawn to working with you. And what I learned so much from you is you're like, here I am. This is what I'm learning right now. And I love that so much. Thank you, Emily. I, I mean, it's definitely been an experience to be able to have these thoughts and have a platform to be able to speak about them and, you know, explore areas of myself that are very vulnerable and have to learn through my students. And I, you know, even shared with you how I still get nervous when I teach that one lecture and it's like very, you know, heartfelt and all of those things, but I end up learning so much from them as they then share their own feelings and give that, you know, information up for the whole group. And it's like crazy. Um, mm -hmm. And I suspect that when you guys have your like experiential learning, that's sort of what you're driving at shift, yeah. um, which is actually makes a lot of sense now that you just explained that about how you're approaching me and then how you run these sessions. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell everybody, cause I do want to, um, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but can you tell everybody a little bit about that process and kind of some of the things that shift offers that might be useful and like, where does somebody start? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, shiftadapt.com, uh, at shiftadapt on Instagram is where people can find what we're up to. We currently offer a program called shift health. It's aligned with everything that we were just talking about. It's not a do these things five times a day and get to this outcome. We teach the principles of physiology, breath work, cold exposure, um, we teach the, some deep principles around time and attention, going into modern stress, helping people understand health as a behavior instead of an outcome. So it's a very content rich course that has this at home online component, but it includes 10 hours of coaching with myself and Brian McKenzie, um, who's the founder of Shift. Uh, that I'm really honored to learn from and work with and work alongside. We co-created Shift Health from our respective bodies of work. He's been in human performance for some 25 years. Um, and then I'm coming in from the trauma side. So, uh, so that's one place people can start now because enrollment's live and that will begin July 19th and it will fill up. So if people want that kind of coaching experience with us, um, that's what's happening there. And then we have a daily training that's breath-based using the breathing gear system for metabolic health, for nervous system health. That daily training is Brian McKenzie's programming. He was a subject matter expert at CrossFit ages ago. He's like an icon in that kind of um, world. And now it's, it's all about exploring his breathing gear system for everything we just spoke about to engage your own autonomy in metabolic health. So that also includes webinars, a learning center, and my skill of stress course, where people can learn the read, regulate, reinforce approach we've been talking about to uh, re-patterning your response to stress of any kind. And if, so I know like for me, I work one-on-one -on -one with you. That was necessary. I feel like, and it's also just I don't know. It's just the way I like to work and learn. Um, but do you still offer one-on-one -on -one spots with people or are you completely booked? I do. I do. I I have, like, okay. Yeah. I, well, I have uh, random acts of availability. They come in waves. I do three and six month programs with people. And I'm currently, I think I have one or two spots right now. 
Uh, and But the best way right now for people that really want to do this work is Shift Health because it's the body of Brian McKenzie's work and my work combined. Everything, yeah. Yeah, so you get to kind of go through um, the first modules about reality, which people are like, what are you talking about? It's like, well, we look at the reality of modern stress and health. We look at the reality of time and attention and modern stress, and we help people really get real about how your perceptions and behavior are shaped by this lack of understanding of like mortality. Basically we, we hit hard and go deep. It's like you 10 out of 10 people don't live. We all die at some point, but, but anyway, do you really live? So that's the reality section kicks it off with this meaty um, piece and lots of journaling and prompts and, um, then we go into physical practices with the breathing gear system, lots of breath-based support, vision, uh, somatic stuff. Then we go into work as deep work in the third module, and that gets into modern attention with switching and screens and how to harness your physiology to participate intentionally in the modern attention economy. And then the last module is elevated relationships, and that's boundary work communication to connect instead of correct, uh, and certainly looking at historical emotional patterning from childhood, attachment theory, uh, and liberating ourselves into this model of presence and physical time to shape relationships from love and intention instead of reactivity and pain. Um, so shift health, I think, is right now the best way to get like a very intensive immersive coaching experience just imagine if that was offered to every high school student <laughs> the world would be like a completely different place it's really unbelievable it should be like a man you know first line of defense if you're having any mental health struggles like just take this course and just learn about this you know we're excited about it yeah we were the results back to results but people's experience um has been extremely rewarding. It's sort of uh, the journey that we have been on that we're sharing. Um, it's awesome. It accessible for people, yeah. Well, I'll link everything in the notes too so people know where to find you um, and find Shift and everything. But I really, really appreciate it. This was a great conversation to kickstart this podcast. Yay. And I'm really thankful you were the first guest that I had on. I think it's going to bring about a lot of really good conversations with more people and create some awareness. So thank you so much, Emily, for sharing all of that. Thank you too. You're meant to do this. That was really fun. And I just loved it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.